Hi, I'm Bo Carnes with FreeCodeCamp.org. In this course, I'm going to teach you how to make a full stack web application using the MERN stack. But I'm going to teach you even more than other MERN stack courses. I'm going to show you how to convert the back end of the app to serverless and how to host it for free in the cloud so you don't even need Node or Express. The MERN stack is a popular stack of technologies for building a modern single page application. MongoDB is a document-based open source database. Node.js allows JavaScript to run outside a browser in places like a web server. Express is a web application framework that makes it simpler to code a web server in JavaScript. And React is a JavaScript front-end library for building user interfaces. In this course, we will be building a restaurant review web app. First, I will talk about MongoDB and how to host your database in the cloud using MongoDB Atlas. Then I'll show you how to create the back end of the app using Node.js and Express. Our server will interact with the database using the native MongoDB JavaScript library instead of the Mongoose library used by many other MERNstack courses. Why use an extra library if you don't have to? Next I will show how to create the front end with React and connect the front end to the back end. At that point, the MERNstack app will be complete. But I'll have one more thing to show you. In the final part of this course, I will show you how to replace the Node Express backend with MongoDB Realm. This is a serverless platform that will allow us to do everything in the cloud without running our own server and with a lot less code. Then I'll show you how we can use MongoDB Realm to host our React front end so our entire web app will be hosted for free on MongoDB Realm. If you already know a lot about the MERN stack, just skip to this timecode and go straight to where I show how to convert the Node Express backend to use MongoDB Realm instead. Let me show you an overview of the structure of the app we're going to build. Over on this side, we have the M of the MERN stack, MongoDB. We'll be hosting this on MongoDB Atlas. We also, have, and then we have the E and the end. This is the back end, Node and Express. You'll see that Express is just part of Node, and this is where we're and we're going to be running the, our back end server here. And then we have our React front end, and we'll be running our React on a local server too inside Node.js. And then the client. So this is what people will see when they go to the website to, to our web app. So let's start by talking about MongoDB. First, a quick overview of the MongoDB database. In the tabular or relational world, we think of things like databases, tables, rows, etc. MongoDB has similar concepts that use different terms that I'd like to make sure everyone is aware of. Instead of a table, we have collections. Instead of rows, we have documents. We can do join operations with the lookup operator. And instead of foreign keys, we utilize references. MongoDB is very well suited for handling data with a wide variety of relationships. Let's have a quick look at the document model to see. Here's an example of a MongoDB document. It looks very much like JSON. We can see in here a variety of relationships, an address, a title. Here's the different data formats that are all in the document. MongoDB stores data in BSON format, or binary JSON. This provides for a wide variety of support for data types, like strings or integers. And in our code, we're sometimes going to have to do some converting between JSON and binary JSON, specifically for the object ID. OK, let's get started creating our database. You can host your MongoDB database locally, but I found that it is easier to host the database using MongoDB Atlas, so we can do everything in the cloud. And eventually, we will literally do everything in the cloud, where our entire back end and front end is in the cloud, and we can actually do it right all on MongoDB Atlas. But for now, we're just going to create the database. We'll be using the free tier on MongoDB Atlas in this tutorial. So the first step is to create an account, or you can just sign in. So once you're creating your account for the first time, you're going to have to set up the account. So you can uh, create an organization. Everything's going to have to have an organization. I'll just call it Bo's Org. For the project name, uh, for our first project, I'm going to put Mern Stack. So we're going to call this the Mern Stack Project. And preferred language, well, we'll be mainly working with JavaScript and the Mern Stack. So let's go past this. And then I'm going to choose this free tier. 
okay, now we're going to be choosing where our uh, our files are going to be stored at. And we can just basically choose all these default options. If we choose these default options, it's going to be on the free tier. Uh, you probably want to actually choose a location that's close to where you're at. So if none of these are really close, you can actually check some of these other cloud providers and just kind of pick the one that seems to be closest to where you're currently located. I'll just keep on the default and then I'll just do create cluster. And you can update the settings depending on what you need. Um, you can actually pay more if you need a bigger cluster. But for now, uh, when we're just learning, it's good just to start with the free version. Okay, after the cluster is created, you'll have to configure it so you can connect to it. So we'll click the connect button here. And then we're going to have to have a whitelist IP. So just add the current IP address. So we'll be connecting to it right from our computer because we're developing the backend locally. So I'll just add my current IP address. And then uh, we'll create a database user. So I'll just create it as my name and the password as Mernstack. We'll choose a connection method. And we'll be connecting through uh, MongoDB's native drivers. So this is going to give us the connection string we're going to use to connect from uh, from MongoDB and Node.js. Now eventually we'll have to come back and copy this, but for now we'll just leave it and we'll come back and get this when it's time uh, when we're doing our code in Node.js. And I can just close this for now. And now we'll add sample data to the database. One thing great about MongoDB Atlas is that when you're doing when you're creating a demo app or you're just trying to try things out there's a lot of sample data you can just use so you don't have to do all this work of finding your own sample data so i'm going to click these three dots here and go to load sample data set and then load sample data set and this is actually going to create a bunch of different data sets right within our cluster Okay, after the sample data set is successfully loaded, we can actually use this interface to explore the data set, data set and see what's in it. So I'm going to click on Collections. And then these are all the different data sets that are in here. There's Sample Airbnb, Sample Analytics, Geospatial, Inflix, Restaurants, Supplies, Training, and Weather Data. For this tutorial, we're going to be using the sample restaurants data. And you can see there's the neighborhoods data and there's the restaurants data. And if we look at the restaurants, we have a list of a bunch of restaurants in New York. So this one's cr called the Riviera Carrera. I guess I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, so it's going to show the cuisine and the borough. And then there's also going to be an address for each restaurant. So we are going to be using this data in our app. So let's start creating our app. We're going to start creating our backends. So I'm going to go over to the terminal here. I've already created a folder called Restaurant Reviews. And I'm going to just make sure I have the right version of Node. And so that's going to be a good version, 12.18.0. And now we're, we are going to first start with our backend. We're going to start by creating the backend of the app with Node.js and Express, and then we'll create the front end with React. And then, like I said, in the final section, we'll switch out the Node.js Express backend with MongoDB Realm. So inside this root folder, I'm going to create a new folder called backend, and then I'll switch into it. Okay, now that I'm in this uh, folder, I'm going to, we're going to create a package.json file inside this folder by running npm init. And then, okay, we've initiated our package.json file since we're going to be using Node here. And now we're going to install a few dependencies. So we'll do npm install. We're going to do express, cores, mongodb, and dot env. So let me tell you a little bit about these. So Express is going to be what we use for the, the web server. It's going to help us make the web server. CORS stands for cross-origin resource sharing, and it allows AJAX requests to skip the same origin policy and access re resources from remote hosts. 
the cores package provides an express middleware that can enable cores with different options. Uh, basically, it's going to make it so we can make the right connections on our network that we need to make. Without that, we could have some errors. And then the MongoDB dependency allows us to interact with our MongoDB database. The .env dependency loads environmental variables from a .env file into process.env. So this makes development simpler. So instead of say, setting environment variables on our development machine, they can be stored in a file. So that will we'll all make more sense later once we actually create that file. And I guess the last thing we'll do, it will install um, NodeMon. So if I do npm install slash g, that means it's going to install it globally. We'll do NodeMon. And that's going to make development easier. Uh, it helps develop Node.js based applications by automatically restarting the Node application when file changes in the directory are detected. So we don't have to restart the server every time we make an update to our files. Okay, time to create our backend server. We're going to separate our main server code from the code that is accessing the database. Also, the routes will be in a separate file. Since we will be using ES6's import statements, the first step is to update the package.json file. In that file, after the line main uh, index.js, we're going to add type and then we're going to set that to modules. Module. That's going to allow us to use the import statements from ES6. Okay, I'll just save that. And then I'm going to create a new file in the backend fo folder. It's going to be called server.js. Now, in the server file, we'll configure an express server. We'll attach the cores and express.json middleware, since we'll be receiving and sending JSON, and specify routes. So let's start by importing everything we need to import. Let me just zoom in a little bit on this code here. We're going to import express from express. And then we're going to import cores from cores. Now I'm going to import a file that we still have to create. It's just going to be called restaurants from and then the directory we're going to create it is api slash restaurants.route.js. Okay, because we're going to have our routes in a separate file. So that's why we're, we're going to, that's the file we're going to have our routes in. So let's make our express app. So const app equals express. And that's what we're going to be make, using to make our server. And now we have to apply our middleware. So app.use. So these are the things that Express is going to use. And that's going to use our, our, cores, our cores module. And then we are also going to use express.json. So this express.json line, this in old versions of Express, if you've ever seen other old tutorials, they used a, a something called body parser. But that's now included in Express. So just doing express.json means that our server can accept JSON in the body of a request. So if someone sends a GET request or a POST request to our server, it can, it'll be able to read JSON. Okay, now let's um, specify some of the initial routes. So we're actually going to be putting most of our routes in another file, but we have to uh, specify what our initial URL is going to be. So since this is an API, the general procedure for API URLs is to say it's an API here, and then what version, version 1, and then this is the restaurant's API. So this is going to be the URL people go to, so our, our Basically, our main URL, which is going to be localhost with the port number, and then it's going to then you put API slash v1 slash restaurants for our URL that people have to go to, and the routes are all going to be in the restaurants file, which we still have to make. But if someone tries to go to a different route, let's make a a message that appears if anybody goes to a route that doesn't actually exist. So we'll put an asterisk here. So if anybody goes to a asterisk means means wildcard. If anybody goes to a route that's not in our 
in our route file. Then we're just going to return something. So it will just return a 404 page that just says not found. Okay, and now I'm going to export this. We're going to export app as a module. We'll be, then be able to import this module in the file that accesses the database, which will be the file that you actually run to get the, the server running. We just want to separate our main um, server code from our database code. But before we create that file that connects to the database and starts the server, we'll create a .env file to store our environment variables. So I will save this. I will create a new file. Go to new file. And then this is just going to be .env. So this is where we're going to set the, the URI of our database. So we need to get the URI. So to get the URI, we're actually going to have to go right back to MongoDB Atlas. So if I click connect, then we go to choose a connection method, connect your application, and then we have the Node.js uh, already selected here. So we just need to copy this URL here. So now let's go back to our .env file. So in this .env file, we're going to create the variable for the, the database URI. So I'm going to be calling this rest reviews underscore db underscore URI. And then I'll just paste the URI in, and then I'm going to have to update some things. So we got the username Bo, and the password is going to be Mernstack. And then I'm also going to have to update this part, where it says my first database. This database, the database we're going to access is the sample, the sample restaurants database. And then we have to create another variable called rest reviews. in s and we're going to set this to the first database again so this is going to be sample restaurants and now we have to set the port this is going to be the the starting port that the server is going to start off to 5000 and then we're going to create a new file i'm going to go new file and it's going to be called index.js so in this file we're going to connect to the database and start the server. So first we're going to just import the file we already created from .server.js. So that's the file we already created. We're also going to import MongoDB because we're going to be accessing MongoDB. And then we're going to import .env. This is what allows us to access our environment variables. Now we have to configure .env. So we'll load in the environment variables. And then we have to get access to our Mongo client from MongoDB. Oh, this would be const now we have to create our port number, or we have to set our port from our environment variable. So to access an environment variable, we'll just do process.env. And then we put whatever we specified in our .env file, which was port. So port is the port number. And if somehow that cannot be accessed, we will make it 8,000. OK, now we will connect to the database. So we go to Mongo client dot connect so and once we connect to the database we're going to have to pass in some information we're going to have to pass in the database URI which is process dot env so this is our environment variable rest reviews db URI so that's the name we created now we'll pass in the options for accessing the database. And we want to make it so only 50 people can connect at a time. 
So pool size 50. And we'll set the W timeout to 2500. So after 2500 milliseconds, the request will time out. And then use new URL parser is going to be set to true. That is added because the MongoDB Node.js driver rewrote the tool that it uses to parse MongoDB connection strings. And because it's such a big change, they put the new connection string parser behind a flag. So now we're going to catch any errors. So if there's an error, we're just going to console.error or log the error. Stack. And then we'll just exit the process. After we've connected to the database and checked for errors, now we can do something. Then we're going to create a function here async client and app.listen. And app.listen is how we start our web server. So we're finally starting our web server after the database is connected to. So we're going to listen at the port. OK, we're just going to log that listening on the port. And we're done. So we've connected to the database, and we've started our web server. It's almost time to test out the backend server. But first, we need to make a route. So let's create a new directory called API. So new folder, API. And then I can also create a new file that way. And the new file is going to be called restaurants.route.js. So this is a file that we've already referenced in one of our other files. OK, this time instead of typing everything, I'll just paste in and kind of explain what the code does. First, we're just going to import Express from Express. Then we'll get access to the Express router because this is our route file. We're going to be creating the different routes that people can go to. And then right now, it's just going to be one route. We're going to be adding more routes. And this is just a demonstration route. So the route is just slash. So just if you just go to the root URL, then it's going to respond with hello world. So let's just save that. And now we can actually test our program so far. Uh, just so you remember, from in the server.js is where we access the file that we just created. And it's going to have to start with this. So I'm actually going to copy this because every route is going to start with this. And then it will, at the end of the route, you'll add whatever is here. OK, let's try starting the server. OK, since we didn't get any errors, that means we successfully connected to our database. So we're not accessing any, anything in the database yet, but we're actually at least connected to the database. Let's go to our browser and check the, the URL that we created. So we'll go to the URL bar. I'll type in localhost 5000. And then I'll do API slash v1 slash restaurants and then I'll just go to that page and you can see right here it says hello world so it worked and if we go to any other URL like if I go to slash 9 or something it'll say error not found mm, looks like we have a mistake here so let me go and fix that it shouldn't have this little part when it says not found so let's go back to our so let's go back to our code. And where do we, oh, here's where we have the extra character there. OK, well, everything is working. Now we will make the data access object that will allow our code to access restaurants in the database. So let's create a directory called DAO for data access object. And inside this directory, we'll create a new file. Restaurants.dao.js. 
Now in this file, I'm going to paste in some code and then I'll show you what all it all means. So let me show the code here. Okay, so first we're going to create a variable called restaurants that we're going to use to store a reference to our database. And so we're going to export this class called restaurants DAO. And we're going to have a few methods. Here's the first methods. And these are all going to be async methods. And this is the inject database method. So basically, this is how we initially connect to our database. And we're going to call this method as soon as our server starts. So as soon as our server starts, we're going to get a reference to our restaurant's database. So if there already is the reference, if this is already filled, we're just going to return. But if this is not filled already, we're going to uh, fill that variable with a reference to that specific database. So we're going to try to connect. So you can see this, we're going to await for this. And so connection, um, this is we're trying to connect to our database. And this is the name of our database. This is our environmental variable. And we're specifically trying to get the collection restaurants. So let's go back to the MongoDB Atlas interface. And I can show you where this database actually is right from the interface. So if I click on collections here, and we have restaurants, and see in this sample restaurants, section of the database, we have neighborhoods and restaurants. So we're specifically trying to get the restaurants and not the neighborhoods. We're not even going to use the neighborhoods data in this project. So that's what this collection restaurants is. And if we're able to successfully get it, then great. If not, we're going to send this error message to the console. Okay, so we're going to we're going to add the call to this right when we connect to the the database for the first time right when the server runs and then the other function is the get restaurant so this is the only other function that i just added or the only other method that i just added and this is what we'll call when we want to get a list of all the restaurants in the database so first of all there's some options now these are options that we just created that we just made up specifically for this method and you so when you when we call this method you can put in what filters you want if you want to sort things based on the name of the restaurant the zip code or the cuisine what page number you want because there's going to be a lot of restaurants so you may not want to get all of them at once you're you're only going to get actually 20 uh, at once with this default setting so it's default to page zero. It's default to uh, 20 restaurants per page. And then we're going to put together a query. Now, first it's going to be empty, and it may stay empty unless someone has passed the filters, unless we've called, called the get restaurants method with some filters. And there are three different filters that we've set up. There's the, the name filter. So we can search by name of the restaurant or we can search by the cuisine of the restaurant, or we can search by the zip code of the restaurant. And these are three different types of searches. Queries are very powerful in MongoDB, and there's a bunch of different things you can do. Now I'm just gonna show you three of them right here, but if you wanna learn more about how you can query with MongoDB, Check the resources in the description of this video. First of all, let's look at the, the cuisine and the zip code. So we're just seeing if it equals, if the cuisine from the database, from the entry in the database, equals the cuisine that was passed in. So filters cuisine means that we've called the get restaurants method and we've passed in the, a filter of what the cuisine is going to be. And so we're actually going to search for that specific cuisine. Or we're going to search for a, an entry in the database where the zip code equals the zip code that was passed in. And then this is a little different. To search, to do a text search, um, we're going, instead of searching for something that's equal, we're going to search for any a text search is we're going to search anywhere in that text we're going to search for this name so you can see that 
here, this is a database field. This is a database field, but when we're searching for the name, there's no database field in here. So how does it know which field to search for for the name that was passed in? Well, we actually have to set that up in MongoDB Atlas. So we'll do that later, but we're going to specify in MongoDB Atlas that if someone does a text search, which fields from the database will will be searched for that specific string. So we'll set that up later. So we're going to get the filters. We're going to set the query to be either to be one of these three queries depending on which filter was passed into this method. And then we're going to get a cursor and then we're going to await restaurants.findQuery. So this is going to find all the restaurants from the database that go along with the query that we passed in. If there is no query, if we just had this blank query and it wasn't set to anything, then it's just going to return all restaurants. And then we're going to catch an error, and then we'll just return that an empty list and zero for the total number of restaurants if there's an error. But if there's no error, now we're going to limit the results because it return in the cursor is every single result. But we're going to limit to restaurants per page. Uh, the default is 20. And then to get the actual page number, we do a skip. So we're going to skip from the beginning to whatever page number we're at. We're at. So we're going to multiply restaurants per page times the page number to get to a specific page of the results. Then we just set this to an array, the restaurants list to an array, and then we return the array. And this can actually be changed here to get the total number of restaurants. We don't need all this here. So to get the total number of restaurants, we're just going to count the documents in the query. And then we can return the restaurants list and the total number of restaurants. Or if there's an error, we just return this. OK, let me save that. Now we'll use the methods that we just went over, that we just added to this file, to access the database from our other files. So let's go to index.js. And in this one, we are going to add at the beginning that we're going to import that file. So import restaurants from DAO slash restaurants DAO.js. So we have gotten a reference to this file. And I'll just copy that. And then it's going to be right down here. So right after we've connected to the database, right before we start our server, we are going to call that inject db. So await restaurantsdeo.inject db, and we're going to pass in the client. So this is how we get our initial reference to the restaurants collection in the database. OK, now we're going to create the controller that the route file will use to access the DAO file. So let's go, let's save this. I'll go to restaurants.route.js. And we will need to make it so it uses the controller file we are about to create. So the controller file is going to, to be what is what the route uses. So I'm going to import rest restaurants controller from restaurants.controller.js and now instead of sending this instead of getting this i'm going to do restaurants.controller.api get restaurants and that's something we still have to create so now we're, we're going to get what's going to be returned at this route. That's going to come from this file here, the restaurants controller file, and then this method.
which we're going to create right now. So let me save that. And then inside the API folder, create a new file. And this one's going to be called restaurants.controller.js. Now it looks like we've got some things in the wrong spot. This DAO directory should be in the backend directory. Okay, yeah, so in the backend directory, we have the API directory and the DAO directory. Okay, in the restaurants.controller.js file, I will paste in some code and then we'll go over it like last time. So first, we're going to import the other file we created, the restaurants.dao.js, and then we're creating this restaurant controller class, and there's a few methods. Actually, right now there's just one method, which is the API get restaurants. And when this is when this API call is is called through a URL, there can be a query string. A query string is how we can specify certain uh, parameters. And you'll see that when we do a test later. But when you're typing in the, the URL, you type in question mark and then the key value pairs that you want to pass in to this, um, to, to this API. And so one of the query strings that we, can, that we have is called restaurants, restaurants per page. So we are going to set this variable, restaurants per page, to equal whatever value is passed in through the URL, the query in the URL. So first we're going to check if this even exists in the URL. If this exists, then we are going to convert it to an int. We're going to get this restaurants per page and convert it to an integer. If not, the default is 20 here. Then we are going to do the same thing with the page number. We're going to see if we've passed in a page number with the URL, then we're going to convert it to an int. And then if not, then we're going to get this zero where the page number is just going to be zero now we're going to do the same thing with the filters so the filters are going to start off with as an empty object but if we see the cuisine query string then filters.cuisine is going to be set to the query string if zip code is in the query then we'll set the filters.zip code to the zip code if name is in the query then we'll set the filters.name to the name Pretty soon, once I get this all set up to show an example, I'll be able to show you exactly what those query strings look like. And this will make a lot more sense if you're not familiar with what query strings are. Okay, now we are going to call this get restaurants. That's the thing that we just created, we created before. So we are going to pass in the filters, the page, and the restaurants per page. And it's going to return a restaurants list and then the total number of restaurants. And that's what we specifically made it return. Now, we are going to get a response. We're going to create a response to send to the person or to, to respond when this API URL is, is called. So we're going to respond with the restaurant list, the page number, the filters, the restaurants per page, and then the total number of restaurants. And then rest.json response is when we're going to send a, rest, a JSON response with all this information to uh, whoever called this URL. Okay, I'm going to save that. And now we can finally test to see if our backend server can actually access the database. So let me go back to my web browser. And then we're going to go to the API slash v1 slash restaurants. And if I call that, we should see, okay, we have an error. It looks like we made a mistake. And it looks like I have a spelling error. So let's see where that spelling error was. Right here. Okay, so let's fix that. So after some troubleshooting... I realized I have this spelled wrong, this file spelled wrong. So I'm going to rename and controller. There's an R in that word, controller. Okay, now let's go back to this and refresh. And then you can see it sends back all the restaurants. 
Now we can keep testing the API right within the browser, but it's better to use another tool when you're testing API. So over here, I have a tool called Insomnia. Now, another very popular one is called Postman. Postman and Insomnia basically do the same thing. So if you have Postman, you can use Postman for this. I'm gonna use Insomnia. And then we're going to be making a GET request. So go to uh, it's local source 5000 slash API slash V1 slash restaurants. And now we can see all the restaurants on the side here. So you can see each one that has the address, it has the borough, the cuisine. Uh, we're not going to do anything with these grades in this project, but we have the name here. And now let's check using some of our filters that we created. So in our API that we created in our server, we can filter by zip code. So let's zip filter by this zip code, see 10012. So what I'm going to do is put a question mark. Now zip code equals 10012, and then I'll send that. Okay, look, this zip code is 10012. Let's see if the, what the next one is. 10012, 10012. So it's all filtered by that zip code. If we scroll down to the bottom, we can see everything else that's returned. So we have the page number, we have the filters, which is just zip code, and then we have the entries per page, 20, and total results, 407. There's four, 407 restaurants with that, that zip code. And we could switch to page 2. So that'll show you how you would do that. So we can see the first one right now is a restaurant called Angelica Film Center. But if I do and page equals two, uh, let's see, I messed it up, two, and then I click send. Okay, now the first restaurant is Cafe Gitane. And if we go all the way to the bottom, we're now on page two. There's still the same number of results, and we have 20 per page. So let me just zoom in even more here. And we are going to do a search by cuisine. And then I'm going to do American. Okay, so American cuisine, American cuisine, and now I'm going to search by name. Now, this one actually is not going to work because we haven't got this set up yet, but let's search for, let's see a name, let's see a restaurant name. Let's just search for um, food. What restaurant has the word food in its name? Okay not found. This is the thing I said that we need to set up right within MongoDB Atlas. So let's go and do that right now. Okay, I'm on MongoDB Atlas. I'm in my database under restaurants and I'm going to click indexes. I'm going to create a new index. Let me see if I can make it so you can see this better. Here we go. So I'm going to create an index. Actually, I realized before we create it, we want to confirm that we know the exact field. So let's go, go to the, see what the fields are. So we know the only field we want to search for is the name field. So let's go back to indexes, create index, and then we'll do name. And for the type, it's going to be text. And I'll review that, confirm, and now it's going to create our index. Now let's go back and see if that, that search works. So I'm going to send the same search 
and now it works now that we created that index. And let's look at the names of the restaurants. Well, this one's all about food. This one's feel food. This one's king food. So it's searching for the word food, all about Indian food. It's searching for the keyword food in the name of the restaurant. So we have this part of the API working. Okay, the whole point of this app is that people can leave reviews for certain restaurants. So let's go back to our route file and we're going to create the routes for people to post, put, and delete reviews. So post is to create a new review, put is to edit a review, and delete is if you want to delete your review. So let me add those routes right now. Okay, so we have router.route, .route, and so up here we just made a single get request, but now we are going to be able to make the post, put, and delete all within this one router call to the router. So for the route review, if it's a post HTTP request, it's going to use this method here, put this method, and delete this method. Now we still have to create those methods, and we actually have to uh, import the file that we haven't created yet, but I'll do that right now. Reviews, and then this is going to be the reviews controller. Okay, now let's create these methods that will be called when people go to these different routes. So, in the API, I'm going to create a new file, and it's going to be called reviews dot controller dot js okay so I've pasted in some code for the reviews controller and I'm just going to review it so we start off by importing the reviews deo which we still have to create so we'll do that right after this and then we're going to create the reviews controller class and then there's going to be three methods we have the post review method and then we are going to get some information from the body. Before we got information from the query parameter, and now we're going to get information right from the body of the request. So we get the restaurant ID, and we get the text of the review, and then for user info, we're going to get the, the name and the user ID from the body. And you'll see how all this works when we test it later, and I'll show you how you send this information through the body. Uh, we're going to get a new date, and then we're going to put that all together. We're going to send that to the add review deo, which we still have to create. It's going to send this information, the restaurant ID, user info, review, and date. And then in this other file, which we're going to create, we'll actually send that to the database. But it's going to return success if it worked, and then there'll be an error message if it didn't work. And then our next method is update review. And it's pretty similar. We're going to get the information from the body, the review ID, the text, those are the only things we need. They're just the review ID and the text that we're going to update. We're going to automatically create a new date, and then we're going to update the review. Oh, we also need the, the user ID. We're going to get that in the body, too. And then we just send that all, all over. And that's how we know if we're updating. the. So we get the user ID because we want to make sure the user who created the review is the same one who's trying to update the review. And then we just check if there's an error and return the error message. If the modified count equals zero, that means that the review was not updated, and then we can throw an error here. Okay, the final method is the delete review. This is going to be a little different. This is going to actually have a query parameter instead of the in the body. The, the ID to be deleted is going to be a query parameter right in the URL. And then we're going to get the user ID right in the body. Now, this is admittedly non-standard. For delete requests, for HTTP delete requests, it's non-standard to have anything in the body. But for this example, we're going to do it. Normally, you would do... This is, this is just like a simple version of authentication. This is nothing that you would do in a production environment. But for this example, we're going to check the user ID in the body to see if it's the same user ID that created the review before it's deleted. In a production environment, you're going to have a little more complex things, and you're not going to actually include anything in the body in the delete request. And then we are going to call the delete review and then send over the review ID and the user ID. And if it's a success, we'll respond with success or else we'll have an error. 
Okay, I've been talking about the reviews Deo a lot, so let's create that now. I'm going to create a new file, and it's going to be called reviewsdeo.js. Okay, I've pasted in the code for the reviews Deo. It's very similar to the restaurants one. Uh, first, we're going to import uh, this stuff up here, mainly so we can get access to object ID. We're going to have to convert a string to a MongoDB object ID, and that's what we're going to use this for. We're going to get the reviews. Uh, this is going to just be an empty variable, but we're going to fill it with a reference to the reviews collection. Just like before, uh, we're going to have the inject DB, and um, we're going to see if if the reviews already exist, then we're just going to return. But if not, we are going to access the database, and then we're going to access the reviews collection. And one great thing about MongoDB is that it's okay if it doesn't exist already. It will just automatically be created if it doesn't already exist so whenever uh, we try to insert a document into it. And then the first thing we're going to do is to add a review. And you can see it takes a restaurant ID, a user, a review, and a date. And then we're going to create this review doc here. And we are going to actually um, create a, an object ID from this. And then we are going to um, insert it. And then it'll just insert it right into the database with the, the restaurant ID converted to a MongoDB object ID. And then if there's an error, I'll return the error. And then for the update review, we're accepting a review ID, a user ID, a text, and the date. And the text is the text of the review. And you can see that we are setting, well, first of all, you can see that we are looking for a review that has the right review ID and also has the right user ID. We only want to update a review if it was created by the same user that's trying to update it. And then we'll just set the new text and the new date and then return the update response or return an error and then delete review. It's the same. We're going to get the, we're looking for a review that has the, the ID and also the user ID, so it's the same user that created that review, and if so, we are going to delete that review and then return the delete response or to return the console.log here. Okay, we're going to test out adding review, but first let's get a list of restaurants because we're going to need this restaurant ID because we're going to add the review to this restaurant ID. So now I'm going to make a post request and then I make it to review at the end. Now here's the body that we have to send over. So first we have to send over the restaurant ID and that's going to be this thing that I just copied from over there and then we need the text of the review which is going to be great food and then we need the user ID which is going to be one, two, three, four. That can be a string or a number. And I will put a name. So the name of the person leaving the review, which will be Bo. Now I'll just send that over. Success. Let's go over to the MongoDB Atlas interface. I'm going to refresh, and this is how we're going to see if it got successfully put into our database. So we're on reviews, and here it is. Look. We got text, great food, we got the user ID, we got the name, we got the restaurant ID, and everything got entered correctly. Now let's see if we can edit it. So to edit it, we are going to need the object ID number. So let me copy this, and we'll go back over here. This is going to be a put request and instead of restaurant ID it's going to be review ID and then we're going to put that here now we can keep the user ID and the name in there because it has to check to see if the same user ID is, is creating that review and then we are going to change the text to bad food bad food so 
If I send that, success. Let's go back over here. Now, this whole uh, tutorial isn't really about the like the most secure user authentication methods. So. Uh, this is just all about how to use MongoDB Atlas, how to set up uh, the basic MERN stack. So if you're really looking for how to get the most secure uh, database as far as um, user authentication, you're going to have to check out another tutorial. So I'm just using some basic things as far as sending the user ID with this request and checking for that. So if you want to learn more about security with MongoDB and MongoDB Atlas, check the resources in the description. But you can see it has changed to bad food. So we've updated this item. Now let's see if we can delete it. So let's go back over here again. And to delete it, we're going to, to, to make this into the delete into the query request. We can do question mark and then review, or wait, wait, is it ID? Let me see. It's just ID. ID equals the we'll just delete the stuff in here and it's okay if you send extra stuff in the body just as long as it has the required fields so I'm gonna change this to a delete and then click send cannot read property ID of undefined so let's see what that means oh this user this shouldn't, there shouldn't be a dot there okay now let's check this send and success okay so let's go over here we will refresh zero result it's been deleted so now we added a review edited a review and deleted a review we are getting close to being done with the back end there's just two more things we're going to add we want to be in the let's go see the the routes we're actually going to add two more routes to the route file for the restaurants so i'm just going to paste these in here and i'll explain them so now we're going to instead of getting this gets a list of all restaurants we want to get a, a list a, a specific restaurant with a specific id and when you get to that specific restaurant not only is it going to give all the information that you get when you get all the restaurants, you're also going to get a list of all the reviews that are associated with that restaurant. And then we're going to have a route for cuisines. We want to get a list of all, just return a list of cuisines. The reason why we're going to do that is because on our front end, we want a user to be able to select the cuisine from a drop down menu instead of just having to have all the cuisines memorized. And the way we're going to populate that drop down menu is from this route right here. So you can see these are both routes from the restaurants controller file and so we have to make both of these from the restaurants controller so I'm gonna save this I'm gonna pop over to restaurants controller and then we are going to add so right now we have this method here we just have to add two more methods for those other routes so I'm gonna paste in some code here and then we'll look at it so get restaurants by ID we're just gonna look for a parameter the ID parameter so a query is is, that, is something that's after the question mark in the URL. A parameter is just write something that's right after in the URL after a slash. And then the body is in the body of the request. So we're gonna get this this item, this, this ID, and then we are going to call the restaurantsdao.get restaurants by ID, which we still have to create, we're passing the ID, and we're gonna get the restaurant back. If there's no restaurant, we return an error or we return the restaurant and then we also if there's another error we can return that so also get restaurant cuisines this time it's not going to need to accept any parameters or anything like that it's just going to get get cuisines and that's going to return the cuisines or there's going to be an error okay that was pretty straightforward so now we have to go into the restaurants deo and finish that up there is, this is where it gets a little more complicated okay so now let me just paste in this new code here and let me review it so get restaurants by ID 
so this is going to be more complicated because we're, com we're tr going to be trying to get the reviews from one collection and put it into the, the restaurant. So first of all, you see that we're using object ID. We're going to have to add the same code that we had in the restaurant's deo to get access to the object ID here. So let's go over here, add this at the top. Okay, so let's look at how this works. We are going to create a pipeline. So this is uh, one thing that's pretty cool about MongoDB is that you can create certain pipelines that help um, match different collections together. So uh, we're first of all we are trying to get we're, we're we're specifically trying to match the ID of a certain restaurant, but then we are going to look up some other items, which are going to be the reviews, to add to the result. This is part of the MongoDB aggregation pipeline. Lookup is only one part of it. The aggregation pipeline is a framework for data aggregation modeled on the concept of data processing pipelines. Documents enter a multi-stage pipeline that transforms the documents into aggregated results. It's very powerful, and I'm only going to touch on a small part of it in this tutorial. Check out the resources in the description if you want to learn more about it. MongoDB Atlas, Data Explorer, and Compass can assist in creating pipelines. So from the reviews collection, we are going to create this pipeline that's going to match the, the restaurant ID, and then we're going to find all the reviews that match that restaurant ID. And we are going to set that to be reviews. In the result, it's going to be listed as reviews. We're going to add this. We're going to add a field of reviews, and that's going to be a new thing in the results. Now, if you check the description, I'm going to link to a a a uh, guide that shows you how to create these pipelines. So, if it will give you all the information about creating the exact pipeline that you need if you're trying to do something a little different than this. Okay, then we are going to aggregate the pipeline, which is to collect everything together, and we're going to return that. We're going to return the, the next item, which is the, the re restaurant with all the reviews connected. And then for Git Cuisines, this is kind of the simplest thing here. We have an empty array here. We're just going to await re restaurants.distinct cuisine. That means we're going to get all the distinct cuisines, one of each cuisine, because a lot of restaurants have the same cuisine. So you're going to get each cu cuisine one time, and then we're just going to return those cuisines. And that's all. So we got that saved. It's time to test this out again. So let's just look at our routes file again. That's not it. Here we go. So we're going to test We've tested this route, this route, this route, this route. Now we're going to test these two routes. First, we're going to test the cuisines route. So restaurant slash cuisines. And then this is going to be a Git request if I send for that. And now here's all the cuisines. You can see it's just a list here. And later we can use this to populate the drop down menu. Now we're going to do the ID one. So we're going to look for, a, well, first of all, let's get a list. We need to get a restaurant ID. So if I sent, oh, before that, let's make another review. Because we, when we get a specific restaurant ID, we want the reviews to come back as well. So I'm going to make, I'm going to get the list of restaurants and get that restaurant ID. Now we're going to go to review, post, and let's do restaurant ID and we'll put that ID in there and then we will do the review which is going to be text it's going to say nice and then let's try another one that's going to say bad and this is going to be from a different person I'm going to put one two three four six and this is just going to say Quincy. Now I'll send that. 
Okay, now we have two reviews, and we have this restaurant ID. So I'm going to copy that ID slash, and I'm going to paste in the restaurant ID right there. And this time I'm going to do a Git request and see what happens. Okay, so we just got this specific restaurant ID. If we scroll down, now we have the reviews. Look, this is, this is an array. So remember, Quincy says bad. Bo says nice. So it worked. We were able to get a list of the reviews for the restaurant that way. Now, we never really need to get an individual review. So we don't actually have any route. We don't have a get rev out a route to get a review because we'll, we'll never be getting just an individual review. We'll just be getting all of the reviews or just editing and editing a review. So we are done with our backend server. All the routes work. And now we're going to create our front end and connect it to our back end. Okay, we got the back end of our project created with Node and Express. Now we're going to create the front end. So let's go back to our root directory, our restaurant reviews directory. And now we're going to create the front end. So here I'm going to use Create React App. So I'm going to use MPX. Uh, you may have to install if you don't already have it installed. And I'll do create react app. And then I'm just going to call it the front end because it's the front end of our app. Now, this is going to create a basic React project that we'll be able to update for our purposes. Now before we start actually actually editing our files and creating our front end, we're going to install one more thing, npm install bootstrap. This is a CSS framework and it's just going to make designing our app much simpler. We're not going to do any custom CSS for this project, we're just going to use what's included in bootstrap. And now we're going to install uh, npm install react router dom. We are going to be using React Router to route different URLs to different pages on our site. So let's go over to Visual Studio Code. We're going to close the back end folder and open up the front end folder. Now in this SRC folder we have app.js. This is the entry point for our React app. So this is what we're going to start with modifying. I'm not going to go over all the details about how React works, so it's good to have some understanding about React. But even if you're new to React, you should still be able to follow along. I'm going to be using some parts of React hooks, but again, we're not going to go into a lot of detail. So if you like are really interested in React hooks, there's some other tutorials for that. But we will be using that, and I'll be explaining them a little bit here. So the first thing we're going to do is just do some imports. So we're actually going to update pretty much everything in this file. And the, we're not going to use this logo. We're not going to use this CSS. I'm going to actually paste in these new imports. We're going to import React. And we're going to, from and then from React Router DOM, switch route and link. Because we're using React Router to create our different URL routes that people are going to go to and route to the different React components. And then we just have our bootstrap here. Uh, this is what we're going to be using to style our whole app. Okay, in this app, I'm going to erase everything that's being returned here. Actually, just inside this div. And for now, I'm just going to type in hello world. We're going to make sure everything is working so far. So if we go back over to our terminal, I'm in the front end directory, and I can just do npm start. And it open up local 3000 in my browser. It says, hello world. So let me just zoom in more on that. Hello world. OK, let's go back to our code. And we're going to start making this a little more complex. So this file is going to have a header with some navigation on it. And then it's going to have a route where the main part of the page can switch between a few different routes. So let's start with our components. We're going to start by creating some simple com components that then our router will load the different components depending on which URL that someone is going to or which route someone's going to. So let's open up the file browser here. 
And then under this SRC folder, I'm going to create a new folder called components. And inside components, I'm going to make three new files. We're going to have a restaurants list file. which will list the restaurants. We're going to have a restaurants.js file, which would be a single restaurant. We are going to have an add review, which will obviously be used to add a new review. And then a login.js, which is the login page. So now that we have that, we're just going to make a a simple thing for each one right now. So let me just copy what we have here and I'm going to go to add review. We're just going to start off by making something really simple. And I will call this add review. And we're going to export add review. And then we're basically going to do the same thing for each one of these. This is going to be login. This is going to be restaurants list. And then, oh, this is spelled wrong, so let me rename this. And this is just going to be restaurants. Okay, so now that we have all these created, let me make sure they're all saved. Okay, now we can start creating the rest of our main file that's going to be able to link to those others. So since we are going to be linking to those other components I made, we have to import them at the top. So that's what I'm doing here. I just paste it in so we're going to import add review from component slash add review, restaurant, restaurants list, and login. And now let's see what we're going to return here. Okay, I just pasted in some new code for what this is going to return. And I'm going to go over it right now. It's going to start with the nav bar. Now let me just highlight the nav bar here. Now this nav bar is just basically uh, copy and pasted from the Bootstrap documentation. So Bootstrap has all these different components and suggested ways of how to make them. And so one way you can do, if there's a component you want, you go over to the Bootstrap documentation, you can copy the code for that, and then you can update it for your purposes. So this is just a basic Bootstrap nav bar, and it's going to have three different links. The first link you can see is going to be so it, it's all so this is how the nav bar is styled. It's going to be uh, these different things are different bootstrap classes that are used to expand to style the nav bar. The first link is this one right here, which is going to be the main almost like a, a logo that the main the main brand well class name is navbar brand which is the name of the website restaurant reviews sometimes this would be an image or logo this is just me text and it's just going to go to slash restaurants and you'll see soon that slash restaurants and just slash are they're going to be go to the same the same URL the, the same component and then there'll be two other buttons in the navbar and they're going to be styled a little different they're they're the nav bar nav. So this is the, the brand part of the nav bar. And these, this is the navigation part of the nav bar. And the first item is just going to be to link to restaurants. Now this link part, that's, that's imported right from React Router DOM. And that will route to a different URL, which is going to load a different component. So if you click on the word restaurants, it's going to link to restaurants. And then we have this next section. Now this is going to be one link, but it's going to look different depending on our a variable. So it can either look like saying login, which will link to the login page, or it can say log out and then the user's name, the user not that name. So it could say log out bow. And if it says this, on click it's going to 
run a function, the logout function. And we still have to create the logout function. It's going to determine whether it's going to show logout or login because of whether the user exists. So this is a ternary say statement. Now in React, we can use these brackets here to put in some code. So these curly braces, not brackets, these curly braces are putting in some code. And the code is a ternary statement where we're going to say user, if that's true or false, it's true if there is a user, it's false if this is null. And then the question mark uh, is going to say that the first item after the question mark is what happens if it's true, and then we have a colon. The second uh, section after the colon is going to be if it's false. So if there is a user, we're going to return this code. If there's not a user, we're going to return this, which is to log in. So while we're talking about the logout function, we, we, we're going to implement the login logout function. We're also going to make a, a user variable state, a state variable. So right up here, uh, actually right here, the first line is that we are going to create a user variable in the state. Now here we are going to use React hooks. And it, the method is just like this. Const user set user react dot use state null okay so the react dot use state is a way to to create and then create a, a state variable that you can use in your React app. And this is going to be the initial value, which is null. And so it's going to set null to the user variable. And then we also have a setter. So we can use set user. This is a function that we can use to update the user variable later in our program. So now we have the user variable. And now we're going to create two functions, the login function and the logout function. We'll create these as async functions. So async function login. And you're going to pass in, we're going to pass in the user, but we'll default it to null. And then we're going to set user to user. So now, uh, if you call the login function and pass in the user, this user variable will be updated with the user that you pass into that function. And then we can also do the, a similar thing with the logout function. So async function logout set user null. Okay, so when you log out, it's just making the user null. There is no user. You've been logged out. Just so you know, for this app, I'm not going to be implementing a full login system. I'm going to be basically implementing a dummy login system. That's a little out, a full login system is a little outside the scope of what I want to teach in this tutorial. So we're just making a dummy login system, which is basically a form that someone, when, when someone, uh, fills out the form, they click log in, it's just going to set the user with that those details, and it's not even going to save the user to the database or anything like that. Uh, this is just kind of uh, a dummy login system that you can easily update with a more fully full-fledged login system. You could maybe even uh, set it up to use Google sign-in or some sort of authentication provider, but for now we're just having a dummy system just for this example. But we have this login and logout function. And so if someone clicks log out, it's going to log out the user here. And if they click log in, it's going to go to this URL. And this is going to be a page where you can log in that we still have to create. Well, let's just keep scrolling down. We are past the nav bar section. And now we're going to have basically the, the route section or the rest of the page. So this is the rest of the page here, and it's we are going to use a switch to switch between a few different routes. So the first route is either going to be slash or slash restaurant, and that's going to load this component restaurants list. 
The second route is one that I don't actually need. I was trying something out and I ended up not use, deciding not to use that that thing, that last route. So the next route is restaurants slash ID slash review. So up here we do component equals restaurant list. Here, instead of doing components, we're going to do render. The reason why we're using render instead of components is because this allows us to pass in the props to the component that we're loading. So here we're loading restaurants list. Here we're loading the add review component and we're passing in the props. We're passing in the user to this add review component. Also, uh, we'll be able to access this ID variable um, from, from that component. And then we also have the route of the restaurants slash ID. So this would be loading a specific, and this is going to load the, the restaurants component. And then we have the login route, and that's going to load the login component. So those are all the routes. We have the, the route that the restaurant list route, the ad review, the restaurant route, and the login route. Where it says restaurant, that made me realize that this should be a singular. Okay, let's start with creating the restaurant list component, which is going to list all the restaurants. Now, a key part of listing all the restaurants is getting the restaurants from the database. We have to get a list of restaurants from the backend server that's connected to our MongoDB database, and then we're going to need to display those in the restaurants list. Okay, I'm just checking over on the browser to see how it's looking, and I see an error. So it's obviously, it's really good to check your, to check things and test things frequently to see if you have an error. And then it reminded me of something that we forgot to do. It says you should not use a link outside a router. So let's go back over here. And so we had updated the app.js file, but there's a file that we need to update also that's actually even loaded right before app.js, which is the index.js. And this is really what kind of loads everything else in React. So most of this stuff we don't even need. So we don't need the CSS file because we're just using Bootstrap. We don't need this Web Vitals. But we are going to need something from React Router. So we're going to do import browse browser router from react router dom. Okay, and instead of this react strict mode, we are going to be using browser router. So we're going to put browser router and we don't we're not even going to mess with this web vitals thing so i'm going to save that and then let's go over here and see how it's looking now it says hello world so let's test all of our routes actually so that's the restaurants list we have the login that also says hello world uh, i guess i could have made these say different things so you would know that they're working so like for instance if we switch login we could actually just type in login here if I save that and then now restaurants login so those routes are working okay well let's update our restaurants list like I was saying we're gonna need to get a list of restaurants and the list of restaurants has to come from the database so we have to figure out we have to we have to implement some code that's going to get uh, information from our back-end server. We are going to create a separate file for that. So this is going to be under a new directory called services. So here I'm going to click new folder and put services. So underneath source we have components and services and underneath services we're going to create a new file called restaurant.js and we are going to use a library called Axios 
for the get request, the post request, the put request, and the delete requests. And we're going to create some a helper file that's going to kind of set up Axios how we want it to work, and we're going to import that into this file. So in the source directory again, we're going to create a new file called HTTP common.js. This will be our helper file. Okay, in this HTTP common file, I just pasted in some code. We're importing Axios, which while I'm thinking about it, let's make sure we install that. So let's go over to here. Wait, which one? This one. We're going to oh, this, close, stop the server and do npm install Axios. Okay, got it. Axios installed. Now I'll just restart the server. Okay, back to this HTTP common file. So we're just setting two things. The base URL, which this is the URL of our backend server. Locals 5000 slash API slash V1 slash restaurants. And then this is the base URL and all the other routes for our backend server come after this. And then we're just going to set the header. And now we're going to be able to import this and make our HTTP post, get, delete, request, and stuff like that um, more easily with all these things being set automatically. I'm going to save this, and then I'm going to go back into the services, restaurant.js. And then I'm just going to import that file that we just created. Import HTTP from slash HTTP common and then I'm going to make a class called restaurant data service this is where we're going to make all the functions that are going to make API calls and return the information from the API calls okay I'm going to just paste in all of these functions that we're going to use for the different HTTP requests. So the first request is going to be for get all. So if you call get all, it's going to have a default page number of zero and it's going to do a HTTP get request of this URL. Now this URL is just added, this is what's added to the end of this base URL. So remember this base URL is already the URL for doing the get all and then you can add the page number also, what, what page you want. And then if you want to get a specific ID, a restaurant of a, a specific ID, the URL is this base URL, but slash ID, and then with the ID on here. And then find. The find is going to take three things. The query, which is the actual search term or number, the number if it's a zip code or search term if it's a cuisine or a name, and what you're searching by. You're, you're either going to be searching by a name, by a zip code, or by a cuisine, and the actual search is the query, and then what page number you want. So it's going to do a get request, and this is what it's going to add to the end of the base URL. And it's going to be like zip code, by equals and then the query is going to be what the zip code is and then the page number here create review is just going to do a post request to slash review with the with the data update review put request with the data delete delete with and but you're going to have the id on the end or get cuisines okay now we can start creating our component our restaurant list component First of all, let's import a little more things. So we are also going to be using the use state and use effect from React Hooks. We're going to import our restaurant data service, which is a thing that we just created. And then we're also going to get a link from React Router DOM. I'm just going to update this so it's a different type of function. So this is going to be const restaurants list equals props. So this is how it's going to be able to take the props and use the props as part of this function, this component. So we're going to use React hooks to create a bunch of state variables. So here we are. 
we're creating the restaurants variable, which is going to start as an empty array. And then the search name, search zip, and search cuisine. So we're going to keep track of what someone's searching for on the restaurant list, and then also the cuisines. The reason why we have these is because right on the restaurants list page, people are going to be able to search for these all these items. So we need to have variables for all the items that people are searching for. Okay, I just put in some more code here that I'm going to review. We have here we have the use effect. This is the way that React hooks this is the way you tell React that your component needs to do something after render. So after rendering, it's going to retrieve the restaurants and retrieve the cuisines. And these are functions. We can look at those functions right now. So here's one of them, retrieve restaurants. So we're doing the restaurant data service dot get all. And that's something that we just created in the data services. And then it's going to log the data. But more importantly, it's going to set the restaurants to be the response dot data dot restaurants, and so this is going to go into the restaurants state, and we're also going to retrieve the cuisines. Very similar. We're going to use the data service to get cuisines, and we are going to log them, and then we're going to set the cuisines. Now we're going to add. So this is going to be in the drop down menu. So instead of just putting the response.data into the cuisines variable, first we're going to start with an all cuisines element, and then we're going to concat to this array the rest of the data. So the first element in the data is going to be all cuisines, so that's going to be the first item in the drop-down menu if you don't want to select a specific cuisine, but you want to show all the cuisines. So if we go back up here, You'll see soon that there's going to be a form at the top of the page, and people can search for by name, zip code, or cuisine. So if someone searches for a name, a zip code, or a cuisine, these three functions are going to, when someone types into the search box, we're going to take the value of the search box, and we're going to set the name, or set the zip, or set the cuisine to whatever thing that the person typed in, or in the case of the cuisine, if they selected it. So let's keep going down here. Here's a function to refresh the list of restaurants if that's needed. One of the times is if someone searches for all cuisines, it will retrieve all the restaurants. Okay, now if someone tries to find something, now this function is actually going to be called from these functions. So someone's going to type in the name that they're going to search for and they're going to click the button to search. Once the button is is clicked, then we're going to call this function, find by name. And then we're going to call the find and pass in the search name and the name. If they're finding by zip, we're going to pass in the search zip and zip code. If they're finding by cuisine, we're going to find by, we're going to pass in the search cuisine that they selected and the word cuisine. Or if they have selected all cuisine, we're just going to refresh, refresh the list. So then it goes to this find function. The find function is going to pass in the query and the by. So for example, here the search name and the by is the name. So we're going to call the restaurant data service with the query and the by. If we go back to the data services, we can see the query and the by. So by would be name. So let's say the name, we we're looking for all restaurants that have the word food in the name. So by would say name, and then query would say food. Or by could say zip code, and then query could be the number of the zip code. So after we get the result of the find, we're going to console to log the data, and then we're going to set restaurants to be whatever comes back from the, the backend server. Okay, those are all the functions. So let's just go really quick over the HTML that we're creating. Now we're making heavy use of Bootstrap, so most of these classes are directly from Bootstrap to help style things. And we can see that we have an input group, because at the top of the page, we're going to have three input boxes, or, or three ways that people can search. The first one 
is searching by name, an input, input box. It's just going to say search by name. And the value is going to be the search name. And on change, it's going to be on change search name. To, so as soon as someone types something, it gets set as the name. And then we have the second one. or Well, then we have the button. So if someone clicks this button and on click, it's going to find by name. Then we have this next section, which is the search by zip. It's going to be just like the one we just saw for name, but it's going to be for the zip. So someone can... Um, change the search zip and they click the button it's going to find my zip and then the final one is going to be a little different it's going to be a drop down menu for the cuisines we're, all, we're going to be see all this in just a second on the page but we're going to select on change so on change it's going to do on change search cuisine and it's going to set the cuisine variable to the cuisine that the person selected and to get the cuisines in the list we're going to use this react function uh, this map function cuisines remember cuisines is the list of cuisines and we're going to map it and for each cuisines in that array we're going to return an option for this select box and the value is going to be the cuisine and then uh, the reason why it's substring 020 because some cuisines are very very long and we want to make sure the search box isn't too long so we're going to just have it um, just the first 20 characters or is that 21 characters? Just the first little bit of the cuisine. And so people can search the cuisine, and if they click the button, it'll find my cuisine. Okay, now the next section, is we have another row here. A row is from Bootstrap. And we're going to use another map function to map through the restaurant's array. We're in React, this curly braces means that it's going to be some sort of JavaScript code. And for each restaurant, we're going to first get the address. So we're going to be putting the address of each restaurant. And the address in the database is actually three different fields. We have the building, which is like the number. Then we have the street. Then we have the zip code. So we're just going to put that all into one string that we can use. And so for each restaurant, we're returning this whole thing right here, which again is directly from Bootstrap and they're different cards. And each card is going to have the name of the restaurant, the cuisine, the address, and then there is going to be a link to view reviews and if you click this rink link it's going to go to this new route route restaurant slash and then it's going to have the restaurant ID and then also there's going to be a link here to link to Google Maps so the reason why we have one of the reasons we got this variable up here is so we can use it both here and we can use it for this link to Google Maps so it's going to use this link from Google Maps and it's just going to put the address on the end which is actually going to create a link to a Google Maps of that exact address and then we have a bunch of classes from bootstraps and it's going to be called view map Let's test this out and see what it looks like. I'm going to save this. Okay, and here's our page. So here are the three different search boxes I was talking about. And here we can select a cuisine if we want. And you can see it's cut off like we mentioned. Uh, but most of the cuisines are, are less than those characters. And then we can see all the restaurants. And it cuts off at 20. So we can search by cuisine. If I click search here, now it's just going to show the African cuisine restaurants. Or I can search by name and put food. Click search. And now all the restaurants have the word food in them. Or I can search by zip code. Let's do 10014 and click search. And now all the restaurants have the zip code of 10014. And if I click on view map, let's see what opens here. The Google map opens. If I zoom in, let's see if it even shows the name of that restaurant when I zoom in. Look, it says one if by land, two if by sea right there. And that is actually the name of the restaurant from our database, one if by land, two if by sea. So that actually took us to the map. 
So let's say we want to go back to all cuisines, and all cuisines is also means that um, you can only search for one thing at a time. So if I cl click all cuisines, it's going to go back to every restaurant. Um, another thing really quick, uh, right now I do not have any pagination, and I don't plan to add any pagination. But because of how the API is set up, it would be pretty simple to add the pagination yourself. So you could make something at the end where you can, maybe you would make something at the be, the end of the data or maybe the beginning of the data where you could click next page, previous page, and then go through the different pages. For the front end, we do not curr I do not currently have that in the code, but that's just like an extra thing you could try to add in. But let's go to view reviews. Well, right now it just says hello world. Cause, so we, the route is restaurant slash the ID and we have not created anything for the reviews yet. That's what we need to create now. We need to create what it looks like when you're viewing an individual restaurant with the reviews. So let's go back over to our code. We are gonna open up the restaurants file. And let's update the import. So we're gonna also import use, stay in use effect, and then the restaurant data uh, service, and then we're gonna change this to uh, the other kind of function where props. Now I'm just gonna paste in some code again and we'll review it. But we're gonna create the initial restaurant state, which has all the fields, but they're just set to empty or null. And then we're gonna create a restaurant. We're gonna use the initial restaurant state to set up the restaurant, which is just all these null and empty fields. And then the use effect. Okay, remember the use effect is going to be called when the page, when the component first renders. And how it has the this array here with just this the ID in the end, in the array, that means this use effect is only going to be called if this ID is updated. So if this component is called multiple times, it's only gonna call the get restaurants again if this ID is updated. So it's gonna call get restaurants with the ID and that's where it's going to load the restaurant through the data service. Restaurant data service is gonna get the ID and then it's going to set the restaurant as the response that data and it's going to log that or else if there's an error it will log the error and one thing you're going to be able to do in here is delete a review now this will only you only be able to delete if you are logged in as the user who created that review but when you do delete a review it's going to need a review id and the index of the review from the review array which is the state the, the review the review variable from the state so we're going to delete call delete review with the review id and then with the response we are going to set the restaurant with to be that array the restaurant array without the restaurant that was deleted so we're going to take the previous state of the restaurant array and we're going to splice the index of the one that was deleted. So whatever review was deleted, we're gonna delete from the reviews array, and then we're gonna return that previous state with the spliced array, with, with the array that was deleted removed, back into the restaurant's array. Else, or I'm not else, but if there's an error, we're going to log the error. Now let's update the actual HTML that's returned from here. So we're gonna to check to see if there is a restaurant. So remember, whenever you see the squiggly brace, we're just about to put in some code, and the code is a ternary operator. Okay, so if there is a restaurant, well first let's look what happens if there's no restaurant. If we go down this line here with the ternary operator, if there's no restaurant, it will say no restaurant selected. So if somehow you get to this, you are, this route, and there's no restaurant, it'll say no restaurant selected. But most of the time there's going to be a restaurant and it's gonna, that's what the, so the first thing after the question mark is if it's true, if there is a restaurant, we're gonna, we're gonna put the restaurant name, we're gonna set, say what the cuisine is, what, say what the address is, what the building, the street, the zip code. 
And there's also going to be a button, Add Review, which will link to this route, restaurants slash the restaurant ID slash review. So that's the route to add a review to that restaurant. Now we're going to list the reviews. So first there's this new heading of the reviews. And if restaurant.reviews.link is more than zero, that means there's some reviews. We're going to do something. If not, it's going to sh I'll show you what. If not, it's going to say no reviews yet. But if there are reviews, we're going to map over the reviews. And for each review, and then also we're going to get the index of each item in that reviews array. For each review, now we always have to have a key, so the key is going to be the index. For each review, we're going to put the text. Now these are going to be cards. This is just part of Bootstrap to show cards. We're going to put the review text, and they're going to have the user, which is the name, the name of the user, and then the date. And now this is where we are going to show buttons depending on what user is logged in. So let's look at this. So first of all, we check to see if there is a user, if there's a user logged in. So if there's a user logged in and if the user ID equals the same as the review.user ID, so if the logged in user has the same ID as the user ID of the review, then now it just says and and again. That's just like a, a fancy way uh, to having the, these ands is a fancy way of saying if these are true, then we're going to put this code in here. It, so as far as what what JavaScript you can put inside a React like this, this is kind of the best way to do it. You put and, so it only gets to this last part of adding this last part if the things before it are true. So if both of these are true, then it's going to put two different buttons. We're going to have this delete review button, which see it's going to be delete, and on click when you do, when you click it it's going to call the delete review function with the review id and the index and also we are going to have a link here and this link is going to be an edit button if you click the edit button it's going to call the restaurants it's going to go to the restaurants path the restaurant slash restaurant id slash review so that's the place to edit a review and it's going to pass in the state of the current review so we're going to if we're editing this review we're going to pass in the state of that review so we can fill in the fields with the actual text of the current review on on the review page and that's pretty much it because uh, this is going to create a card for each element of the reviews array Okay, we can test that out. So let me save that. Go back to the, all the restaurants. And remember, we had already added some reviews to this one just from, from Insomnia. So if we view reviews, we can see bad, nice. So these are the two reviews. Now we can't delete or edit them because we're not logged in. We have to log in as one of these users to be able to delete or edit them. So let's click log in. And we can't because we haven't implemented that page yet. So that's what we'll do now. Okay, let's go back to the login.js page. This is going to be a simple page with just two text fields for the user and the user ID that you submit, and then it logs in with that user and user ID. Remember what I said? We're not doing a full featured uh, authentication system. This is just like a dummy authentication system. And you would update this page with something more complex if you wanted to actually use this in anything like production. But we're just going to make something simple really quick. And I'm just going to update all of this with this new page and just go over it. So we're going to we're going to have the use state and then we're going to create the login component. So the initial user state is just going to be a blank name and a blank ID. And then we're going to create the user variable, which is the initial user state, which is just the blank name and a blank ID. And we're going to handle input change because we, we have this form down, down here. And the form is just going to have two input fields. We have this first input field, which is the username. 
and you can see we have the ID of name, a name here. Uh, the value is user.name. If you click on it, on change, handle input change. And then this is also handle input change on the ID, which has the value of user.id. And so no matter whether you, it's doing handle input change for both of these, for the username and ID. Event.target, it's going to get the name and the value from the target. So so the name is going to be this. So if it gets the, it knows whether it's the name or the ID, and, the, and then it's going to get the value and then it's just going to set the, set the is it going to update the user state with the new name or the new ID, and then the only other thing would be if you click the login button on click login, it's going to call props dot login user, and then props dot history dot push slash means it's going to update the URL. So it just goes to this other route. It's going to this route, the slash route. So it's going to log in the user, and then it's just going to go to the home page again. Now you may be thinking, wait, where is this login coming from? Is it calling this login? No, it's, it's actually different. This is props.login. So if we go back to what page is it? I think app.js. So if you see when we created the the route the route for the login page, one thing we passed in as one of the props we passed in as login was login equals login. And this login is actually this login. So we're passing this function to the login page. So on the login page, when we do props.login and pass in the user, this is actually the function from from the other page, from, from the other file. So it's actually passing in the user to this. We're setting the user into this file, into to this into this user variable. And then that user variable through these routes, see, are passed in to the other routes. So that's how we get the user from the login page to these other routes. So let me go and save this. And we'll go try this out. So we're on the login page now. So I'll click a login. I'll put bow1234. I'm going to click login. Now it goes back to the main page. If I click view reviews here, well, look, we can now edit and delete this one because the user and user ID was Bo1234 for this review. Now I can delete or edit. Let's try editing. Oh, we haven't uh, made that page yet. The editing page and the add page are the same page. So, add review. We can try the delete, though. Let's see if the delete works. Yep, that works. And let's see if I refresh if it's still deleted. And it's not. So that did not work. Hmm. Okay, so that delete didn't work, and it was because we're not sending the the user ID here. So the server is expecting a user ID to be sent with this, and a delete can't send data in the normal way because normally most people don't use a body with a delete request, and it's not necessarily best practice. But again, I'm not really focusing on authentication here. But what we're going to do to make sure this, to, to pass in the username, is this. We're going to have to use data, user ID, ID. And we're going to get this user ID here. This should be user ID. And now we have to make sure we call this with the user ID. So if we go over to where we delete something, we're going to pass in the user ID. So delete review, uh, review ID, and then comma props dot user dot id 
Okay, let's see if that works. I'm going to log in with bow1234. View reviews, and let's see if I delete. Now if I refresh it, let's see if it stays deleted. And it stays deleted. So we successfully deleted that review, and it's deleted from the database. Now we have to create the add review page. So let's go to add review here. Now I'm going to update this code, and then we'll go over it. So it starts off like the other ones, React Review State, the Restaurant Data Service, the link from React DOM, and the initial review state is just going to be an empty string, because someone's just going to type in a string for the review. And then we're going to keep track of whether this is a new review, or if we're editing the review. Uh, like I could have titled this something besides add review because we're using the same page to add review and edit reviews, but the default is false. False. We are not editing the review. We're defaulting to adding the review if we go to this page. So now we have to figure out if this editing should become true. If we are editing the review, th the way to find out if we're editing this review is to see if a current review was passed in to this component. So if, if we go back to here, if someone clicks the edit review, it passes in the state of current review. So we're seeing if this state has been passed in. So first we have to see if the state even exists. And if it does, we have to check if the current review is part of that state. If so, then we're going to set editing to true. And then we'll set the initial review state to props.location.state.currentReview.txt. So that's the text of the review that we're editing. And then we are going to create this review variable using the initial review state, which is either going to be an empty string or it's going to be the text here. And then we're going to keep track of whether the review was submitted or not, starting with false. It hasn't been submitted. And this is our handle input change function. So when someone types into the text box, it will change, it will set the review to whatever the person typed in. And I can just, I'll, just, I'll just go and look at that right now. So first we check to see if there's a user. If there's no user, you can't actually add a review because you have to be logged in to add review. Then we're going to, so this is, a, the ternary function. If so, we're going to do this. If not, so if there is no user, it's going to say please log in. See anything after this colon here, it's going to say please log in. But if we are logged in, now we're going to check if it's submitted yet. So if it is already submitted, it's going to do this. So question mark, is it submitted? Right after this question mark is the yes answer. Yes, it'll say you submitted successfully. And then there's going to be a link to go back to the restaurant, so the restaurant that you started on. If it's not submitted yet, then there's going to be a form here. So this form is going to have a description. It's either going to say edit review or create review, depending on whether we're currently editing the review or if it's we're adding a new review. So if editing is true, it's going to say edit review. If editing is false, that means we're adding a new review. It's going to say create review. Then the input form is going to have the value of the review. And then if you type, it will update that value. And then if you click, it's going to save review. If you click submit. So the sub let's look at the save review function. The save review function is going to create this data with the text of the review, the name, which is the props.user.name, the user ID, props.user.id, and the restaurant ID, props.match.params.id. The match.params ID means it's going to be right from the URL. We're getting the restaurant ID right from the URL here. And then if we're editing, there's also going to be one more part of the data. If we're editing the review, then we are going to get the review ID and add it to it, the, the current review ID. So if you're not editing, there's not the review doesn't have an ID because it doesn't get an ID until you create the new review, review. But if you're already editing it, you need the review ID to say what review is going to be edited. And then, so if you're editing a review, it's going to call update review and it's going to set submitted to true. 
if you're creating a new review, else it's going to create a review. In both cases, it's passing in the data. In both cases, it's setting submit to true. It's logging the data. And that's pretty much it for the add review. So let's save that, and then we'll test it out. So click on restaurants. We'll go to Happy Garden this time. There's no reviews yet. Let's see if we can add one. Well, we have to log in first. So click log in. I'll click, I'll do bow, one, two, three, four, log in. And then we'll go to view reviews again, add review. And I'll say worst restaurant ever. Submit. You submit successfully. Back to restaurant. And you can see, here's the review here. Also, let's just confirm we haven't been to MongoDB Atlas for a while, so let's go check to see if it's in there. So let me go back to that page, and then we'll go to reviews here. Loading. Let me try refreshing. And let's see if we can find the review I just added. Worst restaurant ever. Here it is. So Bo1234, worst restaurant ever. So let's go back over. And we can edit. Actually, now it is the best restaurant. I went to it again and realized I was wrong the first time. Submit that. And now it's best restaurant ever. If I log out, I can still see the review, but I cannot edit it and I cannot delete it. So we can see the list of restaurants. We can search. We can search by kitchen. Let's try that word. All the kitchens. We can search by zip code, 1001. We can search by cuisine. Do Brazilian. We can view maps. This one seems to be closed. And we can log in. And I'll try a different name. How about Abby? And we'll do 4321. Now I can view reviews, but I can't edit that one. But I can add another review. Not amazing. If we go back to restaurant, I can delete a review. And this is basically done. We've created a fully functional MernStack app. Okay, and we're going to do one final thing. We're going to update the title that will be on the tab or, or in the top bar on your web browser. So let's go to the public tab here. And then we're going to, or the public folder, I mean. We're going to go to index.html. And we'll keep most of this as is. But we will update this instead of React App. This is going to now say Restaurant Reviews. Okay, we're done. So we finished creating our entire app using the Mern stack, using MongoDB, Express, React, and Node.js. Well, now I'm going to show you that you don't even need Node.js or Express because you can do all of the backend right from MongoDB Realm. MongoDB Realm is a serverless application backend that streamlines implementation of features like user authentication, data validation, and business logic with configurable functions and services that integrate Realm's data access and security rules. So this is the structure of our app so far. But we're now going to replace this E in the N, this whole section, with MongoDB Realm. And we're also going to replace this section, and instead of hosting it locally, we are going to host it in the cloud. So this is what the new structure of the app is going to look like. See, the back end is now Realm, and it's a back end as a service, because it's all hosted in the cloud at Realm. And then the front end is also going to be hosted through Realm. And it's going to be the same React front end. You see the client is going to look exactly the same. Now you can see these little lock icons. After we get everything set up on Realm, we're going to have a lot more security between the back end and the front end and the database and the client. 
So let's start setting this up. So we are going to completely remove the backend that we made with Node.js and Express, and I'm going to show you how to implement that all with Realm. And it's way easier and way faster than creating that whole backend with Node and Express. So we'll still be using the same React front end, but I'm going to show you how to just use that front end with the Realm backend. And after that, I'm going to show you how you can use MongoDB Realm to host the front end as well. So the front end and back end will be all hosted in the cloud on MongoDB Realm. So let's get started. Uh, first, I'm going to show you how to use Realm to create an API that exposes data. And then I'll show you how to update data in a MongoDB database inside MongoDB Atlas. So first, let's go. we're, we're starting in our MongoDB Atlas cluster. And then we'll go to the Realm tab right here. Okay, it automatically goes into the create a new application section. But if you have already been to, if you already have an application, you may just have to click the create new application button to get to the screen. But we're going to call this restaurant reviews. And then I'll just click Create Realm Application. And I don't need any of these guides here. Okay, we got this set up. And Realm has a bunch of features. And we're only going to scratch the surface of what it can do. So you can look through all these things over here. Uh, we're actually going to mainly focus on third-party services. And then later, when we want to host our front end, we're going to go to hosting. But you can kind of play or just look around in here and see the different things that it can do. But we're going to start off by just going to third-party services here. Exposing data through third-party services is at the heart of creating a Realm backend service. So that's what we're going to create now. This is going to allow us to update the data outside of this website. We'll basically be creating the, the wrapper for an API. So let's add a service. We are going to create a service called HTTP. Now there's some built-in, you can choose Twilio, GitHub, AWS, depending on what type of uh, API you're trying to, to connect or create or what type of service you're going to create. But for our purpose, we're just doing an HTTP service. And I'm just going to call this restaurants. And then I'll click add service. Okay, now I'm going to click Add Incoming Webhook. This is what's going to expose this service to the outside world on the internet. So we're in the settings first. We're going to look at that first. And this is going to, this will specify the authentication requirements and other behaviors. I'm just going to call this Restaurants. And this name is basically going to be one of our API endpoints. So each name, each webhook, or each name is going to be a different API endpoint that our front end is going to access. If you scroll down here a little bit, you can see that you can choose the HTTP method. We, can, we have to actually create a different service for each type of HTTP method, like get, post, put, delete. So the most popular type is a git request. So this first one, we're going to make a git request. This is going to be, so we have different API endpoints. We're going to recreate all the API endpoints from our Node Express server right from Realm. And the first one we're going to create is the one that's going to return a list of all the restaurants. You can also set up uh, different types of authentication here or uh, authorization for the request. But since this is a pretty... Uh, basic tutorial where I'm just trying to show you how to do the basics here so we're not going to get into authentication but one cool thing is that MongoDB Realm can is, it makes it easy to either create your own authentication or also hook up with the a Google authentication or Facebook authentication and so you can use that those authentication pages to authenticate for your MongoDB Realm app. We're not going to go get into that today, but I just want you to know that that's a possibility. For now, we're not even going to implement any authentication cuz I just want to, want you to see the basics of how this works. Request validation is important to verify requests. It helps fight against bots that may attempt to interact with your service. An easy way to Im implement this is to require a secret. This is just a get argument. It's a parameter that's appended to the call. Then request will only be processed 
if they include the secret. But for now, we're just going to do no additional authorization. And I'm going to click the Save button. So now it brings us over to the function editor. By the way, when you click the Save button, it actually doesn't deploy anything. It doesn't make anything live until you click the Review and Deploy a button. So that's way you can save a bunch of things and then deploy everything all at once. You may have multiple changes and then you can deploy all of them. But we're not going to deploy yet because we have to create our function. So we're just on the settings tab right here. But now it, once we click save, it automatically went over to this function editor. So now we're on the function editor. And this is the function that will be run when someone calls the API. To call this API or to send a message to this API endpoint, it's just this URL here. So this URL is what we are going to use that our front end is going to send a get request to this URL and then this function will be run. So this function is basically just like the function from our Node Express server or it will be once we finish creating it. This is just an example. It, when you when you first create one of these services, it will automatically put this code in as a function as an example. But we're going to update all this to create a function that's very similar to our Node Express backend. Okay, so first I'll just show you how to create a very simple response and then we'll make it a little more complicated. So we're going to actually get rid of most of this stuff, but let me just show you this. So this is how you get the query parameter. So payload.query is going to be these arguments right here. And then you can get the content types with payload.headers. You can get the body with payload.body. And then this is just kind of showing how you would log that information here. So these are all just examples here. But what we want to do, for now, I'm going to just delete all of this here. And what we're going to do is just try to get, remember, we're, we're trying to return a list of restaurants. So what, what I want to do is just get that collection. We need to get access to our collection, our restaurants collection, right from this function. So let's make a variable, const collection equals, when you're creating a function, you're always going to have access to a variable called context. And if we do context.services.get, we're going to get the get MongoDB Atlas. Now this is just how you're going to get a your database on MongoDB Atlas. And then we put DB sample restaurants. Remember, that's the name of our database. Dot collection, and the collection is just called restaurants. Okay, now let's get the list of restaurants. So let restaurants list. And this is going to be very similar to the MongoDB JavaScript driver. Restaurants list equals. Now we're just going to do await collection dot find dot to array so this is just going to create an array of our entire collection for this example we don't want to return the entire collection let's limit so we're going to just going to limit to 20 dot limit limit and then I'll put 20 and then I'm going to return the restaurant list. And since we're using a wait right here, we're going to make this an async function. So async. And then we can just click the run button. It's going to open up the console. And then we have the results right here. And if I lift this up here, look, we got it right here. This is the list of restaurants. So if I just scroll all the way up to the top, we can see Riviera Kirder. So that's the first restaurant. And so this is the list of restaurants, just the first 20, because we've limited it to 20. So now we could actually just 
put in this URL right into our React front end. And if we call this URL, it'll return that list of restaurants. But we're not going to update our React code to use that URL quite yet. What we're going to do is actually just test this in Insomnia. So make sure to save your function, uh, and then we can test this out. So let's click Review and Deploy. And the settings in Atlas have a configuration-driven approach. So before we finalize the deploy, you can see the settings that we're about to change. This is also the command you would use in a terminal or a program, so you can avoid using this interface, this user interface. But we're just going to use the user interface. So I'll hit deploy here. Okay, deployment was successful. So we'll go over here, and then I already have the URL in here. This is our URL right from our MongoDB webhook in Realm. And if I click send, it's going to see we have our list of restaurants right here. So it worked. Now we're about to use that same URL in our React app. But before we do that, let's improve this function a little bit. We want this function to also be able to be used for searches. So this API endpoint will be able to return all the restaurants, but also if someone does a search for a zip code or a title or a cuisine, it will also return the search results for that. So let's go back to our code. Now this is our backend code. This is the restaurants.controller. And we're just going to actually copy this code and then make a few changes. And then we'll go right back into our function editor. And then I'm going to paste the code in here. But we're going to make some changes so it works for our purposes here. So uh, first of all, First of all, let's move this down a bit. I'm just going to move it, just paste it in right here, and then let's start at the top. Here you can see we're getting the restaurants per page and we're getting the page from the query parameter. Well, there's a different way for, to do this in this function here. We're going to be using payload.query. We're going to have restaurants per page and we're going to have the page. And let's do some destructuring here. equals payload.query. Okay, so that's how we're gonna get the restaurants for page in the page. And we'll have some default parameters. So default to 20 and default to zero. So if it doesn't have restaurants for page, if it doesn't have page, we'll just default to those numbers. And we are going to build up, instead of building up the filters, we're just going to build up the query the query that we're going to send when we do our find here. So rec.query, we're going to use payload.query. And then we are going to set the query to equal, well, we can get the query right from our other code. So we just have to go over to the restaurants deo. And this is what the query looks like. For the cuisine query, it's going to look just like this. Now I'll bring that over. And instead of filters cuisine, this is just going to change to payload.query.cuisine. So you can kind of see we are taking our code from two different files, the restaurants controller and the restaurants deo, and we're combining them all together into our function. So the next thing we're going to be doing is getting our search for the name filter. Well, let's do zip code. Let's do, the next thing we're going to do is get the zip code one. I'll just copy this whole thing from here. Bring it over. And then we'll use zip code. And then this is just going to be payload.query.zip code. And then the final thing is just going to be the name one. Just paste that in there. So this is going to be payload.query.name. 
And to make a text search look uh, work like this, we have to. I already created a text index. So if you just like skip right to this part of this video, you may not have seen how I made that text index. But in MongoDB Atlas, if you create, you can create an index based on any field where you could do a full text search for any field. And I did the search for the name field in our database. I, I created an index for the name field in our, in our database so we could do a text search of that field. Okay, so we develop our query. We're going to get an access to our collection. And then we're going to get our restaurants list. But let's add a few things here. So find. we're going to put the query in here because we're going to do a find based on the query. And we also want to get a certain page number, okay? Because we passed in the page number. And to get the page number, it's going to be skip. And then we're going to do a calculation here. Page times restaurants per page. And then we're going to limit that to, we're not going to limit that to 20 anymore. We're going to limit that to restaurants per page. And then we keep, we're keeping the two array. And then I don't need this anymore. Before we send the response, we are going to have to update something. In the database, all the IDs are object IDs. And we want to create, the, we want to return them as a string instead of an object ID. So we can just loop through the entire restaurant list and update all the IDs to strings in, instead of the object IDs. So I'll do restaurants. Dot for each, and then for every restaurant, we're going to call this function, and the function is just going to be restaurant dot underscore id equals restaurant dot underscore ID dot to string. Okay, and the final thing is that we're going to create this response. But we're going to now call this response data. And restaurants is still going to be restaurants list. Page will be page. And then we'll just convert that to a string. The filters in this case, we're just not going to return anything for the filters. We'll just return an empty object because in our front end, we don't even use the filters. We don't, we, don't, we don't even keep track of the filters in our front end. And then for the entries per page, we'll do restaurants per page and then convert that to a string. And then for the total results, we'll do restaurants list dot length dot to string and then we'll return response data okay let's save this and then well let's just do a test we'll run this it says rec not define looks like we must have made a mistake up here somewhere what do we still have? Oh, this should be, I forgot to change this. Payload, payload. And then we'll try doing a test here. Restaurants is not defined. What did we, we must have made a spelling error. Oh, okay. Restaurants list for each. Okay, so let's run that. And then we get the result. Now we can actually test sending the the query parameters right in here. So let's go to the console. And this is how you would test sending the parameters. You can actually test sending parameters by using these right here. So it has an example here. So I'm going to send a page and I'm going to send it to 2, and I'm going to do name and set that to food. So now we're going to be searching for by name, and we're going to be searching doing the page 2. So let's try that. 
Okay. Well, first of all, you can see that it returned page two. And if I go back up here, let's see the restaurant names. And let's scroll up and look. Oh, see, this restaurant name has the word food in it. Let's see another restaurant name. This restaurant had the name food in it. So that worked. I did, well, this is a good thing about testing this. We can see if there's any mistakes. And I need to notice this, this total result is 20. So it's not, well, I wanted it to return the total results of this find of with the query. But it's actually giving us the total results after we've limited to, to restaurants per page. So there's a few ways we can do this. Okay, so what we're going to do is just copy this here come down here and then the total result is just going to be okay I'm going to change this find to count dot then num num dot to string run okay good we got the right total total results we'll make sure we're saved and then make sure we deploy And we got that function done. Let's try adding this to our React app. So let's go back into the settings. So let's get our URL, go back to our code, and then I'm gonna go back, to, go into our front end code. So our front end code, we're gonna need to go into our, where is our HTTP common. So here's our base URL. We're going to update this base URL, and I'm just going to paste in this URL I just got. And I'm going to take off this section here where it says restaurants. Okay, I'm going to save that and go into our services. And then this file are of all of our API calls. So get all. I'm just going to put restaurants here. And then the search should also work if I just put restaurants here. So that those are the two ones that we've updated. This, the restaurants, the thing when you're going to get everything and when you're going to find specific restaurants. So let me save that. Okay, let's try it. And it works. And to prove that it's working, I'm going to open up my console. I'm going to go to my network. I'm going to refresh here. Let me zoom in on this. If I go to restaurants here, and if I hover over, you can see it's our URL. It's our MongoDB Realm URL. And you can see the cuisines doesn't work because we haven't implemented that endpoint yet. So let's implement the cuisines endpoint right now. And by the way, all the other endpoints are going to be way easier. We started with the hardest one with all the searches and stuff. Well, let's test that first. So let's test to see if that works. So let's type in food search. Look, all about food. Feel food. Now let's try the zip code search. 10014 search. And yep, all the zip codes are 10014. So that works. I assume the cuisine search is going to work, but we're going to have to implement our cuisine endpoint first, so we'll pull that in. So to implement a new API endpoint, I'm going to go back to here, and then I'm going to add an incoming webhook. So we have the restaurant's webhook. Now I'm going to add another one. And this one is going to be called cuisines. And everything else is basically going to be the same here. Oh, it's going to be a get request. Okay, let me go over to the function editor. Now, if you're in the GitHub repository, there's actually a folder called Realm that has the code for all the functions. So the rest of these functions, I'm just going to paste in here. And then I can just go over it. Again, it's going to be way easier. These are all going to be way easier than the last ones. But all this code is basically just a modified version of the code that was in our Node Express backend. And I just modified it to use the thing specific to Realm, like the context that services and basically this is pretty straightforward we get the collection and then await collection dot distinct cuisine and return the cuisines so let me save that 
and then I'll review and deploy that. And now let's just update back in our React front end. Let's update the Git Cuisines. And actually, that should be right. It's just going to have slash cuisines at the end. If we go back to our settings and we go to the URL, we can kind of confirm that. See? Yeah, it just ends with slash cuisines. Our main URL ends at incoming webhooks and then has cuisines at the end. So let's test it. I'll refresh this page here. And now we have all these cuisines. It comes in. And we can do a search. Yeah, we got the chicken cuisine. And let me just make sure right from our networks so if I refresh here and we can see the cuisines is actually coming right from the MongoDB Realm website so that that webhook is working okay let's implement all the rest of them so to see which ones we still need to implement we can go back over here so we need the get one which is slash ID and then with the ID right in there we need the create review, we need the update review, we need the delete review, and then we'll be done. So let's do this one first where we're going to get a single review, we're, we're going to get a single restaurant with all of the reviews. So I'll click add incoming webhook. This is going to be just called restaurant, singular, not plural. And this is also going to be a get request. Pretty soon we're going to do a post one. But this one's a get request. Go to the function editor. Let me just save that. You can see there's an asterisk there. Now there's not because it's saved. And now I'm going to update this code. Again, you can just copy the code right from the GitHub repository if you're trying to follow along here. So let's look at some of the things that are specific to MongoDB Realm. We have the payload.query.id. So one thing tricky for this one, this one uses a path parameter. So right in the URL, as part of the URL, there's this parameter. So remember, it's ID slash, and then it's the, the ID, the actual ID. Then we get that path parameter to look up the ID. That's how it is in the Node Express backend. So that's one thing kind of different on Realm is that it cannot do a path parameter. It cannot get a path parameter. It can only get a query parameter. So we're going to have to switch this to a query parameter. So a query parameter is something that's after a question mark. So it's in the URL after a question mark is going to be a query parameter. If it's just after a slash, just like this, it's going to be a path parameter. So we have to change the path parameter to a query parameter. And it's going to be a query parameter called ID. And so we're going to have to do something else in React to make it a query parameter instead of a path parameter. But it'll be pretty simple. I'll show you when we get to that point. And so we get a list of the, the restaurants, just like before. And then this pipeline, this is basically just copy and pasted right from our Express app to get a list of all the reviews. So, you know, we're, we're, we're sending it the rest, a single individual restaurant, but then we have to go to the reviews collection to get all the reviews. So that's what this uh, pipeline does. And then this is all this information is basically very similar to our Express app. And then right here, we're converting we're going through each review and we're converting the date to a string and we're converting the ID to a string. If we don't do that, our React app won't work with it correctly. Okay, I'll save that. And then I'll just do review and deploy. And then we have to deploy here. So if we go to our URL, it's just going to end with restaurant. So let's see how we have to change the path parameter to a query parameter. So it no longer is going to be ID here. This is going to be restaurant. And we're going to get rid of this slash here because now it's going to be a query parameter, which is pretty simple. We're just going to do question mark ID equals. And now we change the path parameter to a query parameter. So save that. And now let's test it in our browser. OK, I'll just use, leave this network tab open. And I'll click View Reviews. And let's see. OK, it's getting our restaurant. It's coming right from our MongoDB Realm API.
So that worked, and we even got the review here. So that worked too. So now the final things are adding reviews, editing reviews, and deleting reviews. So let me go back to the list of all our webhooks. I'm going to add an incoming webhook. I'll call it review new. And we're finally going to be using a post request here instead of a get request. Go to the function editor. And then I'm going to paste in some code here. And now we're finally using the body. So the body of the request, payload.body. If, if first it checks if there is a body. And if there is a body, this is how we have to get it. From the payload body that was sent to this webhook, we'll get the text. And then we'll have to convert it from BSON to an EJSON object. EJSON is basically JSON with a few extra types. This body includes the name, user ID, and the other data sent to this webhook. So this is something kind of specific to MongoDB Atlas for Realm. But we got the body, and then we have to get a list of the review, the, or not a list, but we have to get the reviews collection, a reference, reference to the reviews collection. And then we have to create our document that we're going to insert with by.name, by.user user underscore ID, a new date, by.text. And now we're converting this string to an object ID with bson.object ID. And then we are just inserting it into their database await reviews.insert1 review doc. So that's pretty straightforward. And I'll save that and deploy it. And we're not going to put it into our React app yet. Let's just create all of these and then we'll put them all into our React app. So add incoming webhook. This is going to be the editing one. So review, edit. And then this is going to be a put. Save that. Function editor. I'll paste that in, and it's pretty similar to the last one. We check to see if there's a body, and we get we get the body into this variable here. We get a reference to the reviews. We create a new date, and then we update. So reviews the update one. First, we have to uh, just like in our Express app, we're searching for the one to update by the ID, which we do have to convert to an object ID here, and we also are making sure that the user ID is the same as the ID that created that review, and then we just have to update the text and the date, and then we return the update response. So save that, review and deploy. Now I actually don't have to be deploying this each time, I can create all of them at once and then deploy it, but it's good to kind of get in the habit or you'll just forget to deploy and then you won't be able to figure out what the error is. Okay, and this is the final webhook that we're creating and it's going to be review delete. And this will be a delete request here. And then function editor, I'm just going to paste in the code again. Keep in mind there's no authentication on this function, so this is there's this is not for use in a production environment. It's just an example to see how how this thing would work because you're probably going to want to have some authentication before someone's able to delete something obviously in a production environment. But let's just uh let me just we'll just do it this way for now and we can see if it works. So we'll just save and we'll review and deploy. Okay, let's update our React app with the new URLs. So this review is going to be review new, and then update review is review edit, and then delete review is review delete. Okay, that should be done. Let's test it. Okay, let's let me log in here. View reviews, add review, best ever today. Okay, submit. Back to restaurant. Let's see if I can edit it. And let me just check the network tab so I can see where the requests are going to. So edit, 
and best ever yesterday. Submit. And then you can see, yep, it uses MongoDB Realm. Okay, let's see if it deletes right and deleted. And yep, it's at the restaurant, it's at the MongoDB Realm URL. And we're able to successfully delete. So we just created the entire Node Express backend all in MongoDB Realm. And it was way quicker. It didn't really take that long to, to put it all together. And now it's all in the cloud. It's and it's connected right to our MongoDB database. It's just a lot simpler way to create a MernStack app. Basically, a MernStack app without the E and the N. And now I'm going to show you how you can very simply and quickly host your React front end right from MongoDB Realm, and it's completely free. Okay, if you still have your React app running, stop that. And I'm in the directory for the React app, the front end directory. And I'm just going to do npm run build. And this is going to create a build directory that we can upload directly to MongoDB Realm. Okay, back in Realm, let's see where we're going to upload our front end. Well, look at this section right here, hosting. So we'll click hosting. Host your website here. Enable hosting. Now I just have to drag over my build folder right over to here. Okay, so I'm just going to grab, select all the files in my build folder. Not the folder itself, just the files in the build folder. I'm just going to drag them over here, and then they will upload. I can overwrite index.html. And then after they're uploaded, I'll just click Review and Deploy. Deploy. And it deployed was successful. And it says, your site is in the process of being created, which may take up to 15 minutes. So it could take a little while before you're able to access the site. But it has the URL right here. So we'll just go right to this URL. But first, let's go into the settings and look at some of the settings. So you can actually use a custom domain. So you can use any domain you like. I'm not going to go through those instructions here. But if you just click View Instructions, it's going to show you everything you need to know to how to uh, use your custom domain. So I'm just going to copy this URL here. And look, it already works. I just went to the URL. And it's hosting my React app right on here. And let's see if we can do a search. How about ice? Okay, everything that the names that have ice. We can try a cuisine. That works. Let's see if we can do a review. First of all, I'm going to go to all cuisines. And we'll do happy garden. Add review. Oh, login. Oh, one, two, three, four. Oops. One, two, three, four. Eh. And we can edit it. And this is all working. Everything that you're seeing, including the front end, the back end, the database, it's all through MongoDB and MongoDB Realm. And even delete works. It's done. Our entire app is hosted for free in the cloud. Everything about our MernStack app is hosted for free in the cloud through MongoDB and MongoDB Realm. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to use your code for good.